Welcome, as it says on the front of your bulletin, to the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, it's a joy to see all of you here, whether you're a regular attendee or first-time member. Uh, it's really glad to see you. We're delighted to have you with us. You know, our church is a place where we embrace each other, we support each other, and we grow in our faith. So, once again, welcome. If you'll please stand and turn in your hymnal to page 275. We're going to do this a little different. If you can read music, do not look at the notes. This is just for lyrics only. Diana's going to play a different tune. So page 275, lyrics only. Take a moment just to uh, mention our sound assist technology that we have here. You know, our church is a, well, you're not going to get a high tech service here. And so we try to keep it to a minimum, but these are old devices that still work well. Now what they do is they pick up an FM broadcast and anything coming through this microphone comes through here. It's not an amplifier. It's not going to make the roar in here worse or the echo worse. So if you have trouble understanding, you might pick up one of these out front. They do have a regular headphone jack if you want to bring your own. Uh, but that's something people didn't understand. It's not just for magnification. Um, this is Youth Week. And if you'll keep the youth in your prayers all week long, that would be great. But next Sunday is Youth Sunday, and the youth will be conducting the worship service, and we're going to have a potluck afterwards. Uh, so uh, the membership will be providing salad, bread, and dessert. Please bring either a meat or a vegetable dish. Now that's sec next Sunday after service. Um, if you'll look in the back of your bulletin, and I'm going to have to uh, find my bulletin somewhere here. There it is. So if you'll look in the back of your bulletin, you'll see that today after worship, disciples' bells are going to rehearse, and then youth group will meet at 5 o'clock. Come Monday, men's fellowship will be meeting, and I heard Harvey Hardy say he's got a special presentation, so I can't wait for that. He's also cooking. Hardy, what are you cooking? Okay, so Hardy said if you're, all the men should please let him know so he can get a number on how many bratwurst he's going to be cooking outside with sauerkraut. 
and red cabbage. They're coming because what? Okay, okay Hardy says your I'm options sorry. are either text him, call him, or call Barbara, and okay. she'll let him know. I have a mic now. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, because if you show up and you didn't tell me, you might not get one. <laughs> so anyway, I appreciate it. I'm also going to have a short slideshow on Ginger's and I's trip to Germany. So... It's not much, but uh, just a few little highlights. So anyway, look forward to it. I'm going to grill the Brockwurst, so they're going to be done right. Thank you. Okay, on Tuesday, Lunch Bunch will be m meeting at Anthony's Italian, and then Chancellor Choir will meet at 415 on Tuesday. Wednesday, we got the Men's Bible Study. Thursday, Crazy Crafters. And also on Thursday, Disciples of Music will meet. Um, Elders meeting will be Sunday the 27th and potluck lunch, as we mentioned, next Sunday the 27th. Does anyone else have any announcements, uh, anniversaries, birthdays, uh, coming? Thank you. Uh, am I on? Am I on? Can you hear me? Uh, early voting starts tomorrow. There's two weeks of early voting. You have no excuse not to vote. Uh, I have a copy of the official ballot that you'll be looking at on election day, our early voting. I have some copies in the Northex. So if you'd like a copy of what you're gonna be voting on, if there's none out there when you get there, call me and I'll get you a copy. So it's early voting, Creekmoor Park, Ben Garen, uh, Greenwood, so there's no excuse. Did you know that I read somewhere that only 30, something like 35% of the registered voters vote each election day? So let's get that percentage up a little bit. Thank you. Okay, any others over here? I got two things. Last weekend I was at a swim meet and I got six personal bests. Also last week, I got inducted into the National Honor Society at Northside. Wow. All right. Yay. Anyone else? Okay. Good job, David Trent. Good morning, First Christian. How are you today? This is the day the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I notice we have several guests and visitors here with us today. I won't call you by name, but certainly we want you to feel that you've come to the right place today. We affirm your presence, and we want you to know that God is here today. He's meeting us here today, and we pray that you will be helped by being here. This time, if you would please join me in the call to worship, if you would stand, remain standing for the invocational Lord's Prayer. O oh God, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell those who walk blamelessly and do what is right.
standing on the promises of Christ, my King, through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Father, we come standing on your sure promises that never fail. You promise never to leave us alone. You promise to meet us here every Lord's Day on this hallowed praying ground. As we gather in your holy and righteous name. We thank you for being who you are and never shorter than your word. Thank you for your keeping power, your amazing grace, and your unfathomable love. We worship you, we praise you, we adore you. Please look beyond our faults and meet us at our point of need. Please be merciful to those among us who are sick and afflicted, those who are struggling with various life issues, even those who are recovering from the devastating hurricanes that we have witnessed recently. Bring our country together, and we pray for peace in the Middle East. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us that when we pray, say, Our Father. Be seated. Today's scripture is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. You can find this in your Pew Bible on page 984. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice, all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it, you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and, pre chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. 
Thank you. Beautiful. Very beautiful. Lord, bless now <coughs> this your word. Bless it, magnify it. Use it as you use this feeble preacher. Preach through me, Lord. Give me wisdom <coughs> and bless now in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> this word today in first. Peter is Peter telling us that God is at work in us. This is the same Peter who was with Jesus over in Matthew that night when Jesus declared, <clears throat> Upon this rock I will build my church. I have preached from that passage more times than I can remember down through the years. And I can honestly say that I have never preached this verse of passage the same way twice. As a matter of record, <clears throat> it was March 1980 when I preached my trial sermon at the Rising Star Missionary Baptist Church on 55th and Woodland Kansas City, Missouri. It was from this same passage. And the title of the sermon was, Who Do You Say Jesus Is? Since then, I've always been struck by the nuggets of divine truth found in this powerful word. When asked by Jesus, to his disciples who were gathered there, who do you say that I am? It was Peter stood up and announced, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Only here in Matthew do we hear Jesus's response. You can find this text over in Mark and Luke However, only in Matthew does Jesus reply, Upon this rock I will build my church. Here, Jesus is telling Peter, based on what you just said, based on eternal truth that you have declared, me being the Son of God, I am introducing to the world today the church. In this text, prior to that news conference, if you will, on that historic day in Caesarea Philippi, no one had ever used the word church in everyday conversation. Ever since the exodus of the Israelites in Egypt, there had been always this idea of a people of God who were special. The ecclesia, which means that God has chosen for himself a people called out of the world for the purpose of declaring that he is the one true living God. But the church as a living body did not exist until Jesus spoke it into being. No one had ever thought about church as a living organism. No one could have seen then what we know now about the church. And now here we are 2,100 years later. There's hardly anywhere in the civilized world within traveling distance where there does not exist some form of the church. Church is the most visible evidence of the body of Christ in the entire world. So the question begs to be asked, what did Jesus mean when he said, I will build my church? Our understanding about the church is vague and limited until we unite this passage in Matthew 
with this passage in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we get a clear understanding of what Jesus really meant when he declared church in, into existence. When Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, based on 1 Peter 2, it is evident he was not talking about the same thing that many church folk think the church is today. Jesus was not talking about a building with an address where people come once or twice a week. The building Jesus is referring to does not have a parking lot, does not own vans. Jesus is not talking about a place held together by cement, brick, and mortar. He's not referring to a place with a spacious sanctuary with padded pews. The building he's talking about is not adorned with stained glass windows and a holy altar down front. The building that Jesus is talking about does not have a pulpit and a choir loft to sing songs of Zion until we get happy. He's not talking about a place where the doors need to be locked and bolted when the worshipers have left. He's not talking about a building with a steeple. Jesus is not really speaking about a place at all. He's talking about a people who gather at the address in his name. We are, we are the church. First Peter chapter two is suggesting to us that the building that Jesus is referring to is not simply a place at all, but a living, breathing organism he calls his bride. He's not married to the building. The bride of Christ, the people of God, church is us. We are the living stones, as Peter tells us, that make up the church. We are a body of baptized believers who have chosen to enter into covenant one with the other to glorify our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And may I tell you that where two or more of us are gathered in his name, that place becomes the church, wherever they may happen to be. The building that Jesus is referring to is us. That's what the church is. That's where the church is. The church is a body of living stones who have accepted Jesus Christ by faith, who have made them, him their personal Lord and Savior. We were once dead stones. Don't be offended. On our way to God knows where until we <coughs> met Jesus. All have sinned and come short the glory of God, we hear in the Bible. But since the gift of God is eternal life, now we are alive. Now we are living stones because the atoning death of Jesus. We are alive in him and on our way to glory. We have been promised eternal life. But even though we are saved, there's still a problem. We are still here, saved but still here in the world. We were once dead in the world, but now we are alive in Christ. We are living stones. We are saved, but we are still broken stones in need of repair. Some of us have fallen down. Some of us have made mistakes. We've all messed up. Most of us have done things we're not proud of. I confess that I have. Nevertheless, Jesus has saved us. But he goes on about this business of repairing us and putting us back together. I believe this is what he meant when he said he will build his church. The building is what's taking place in us. This is what he means when he says, I will build my church. 
He is building you. He's building me. He's working on a building, and the building is us. Here in this verse, in 1 Peter, we are told that we are being built into a spiritual house. From the time we come to him in this life until we meet him in glory, he's working on a spiritual building. And please don't be offended with me when I tell you that the building is never finished. Not in this life. We are building. Jesus is working on us. I'm not what I used to be, but far from what I am becoming in Christ. Now, how many of you have noticed on the corner of 74th and Rogers, there's a huge mess there called Mercy Hospital that's under construction. I remember working there, and I can tell you that the mercy I see today is not the mercy I saw when I worked there because it's under construction. But the mercy I'm going to see two or three years from now, since it's under construction, will not be the same mercy that I'm looking at today. You and I are under construction. We are not the us we used to be, and we're not the person God is building us to be down the road. This church as an organism is us, but the church as a place is full of broken stones. In every church, in all churches, or most churches, let me qualify that, there is the evidence of brokenness. If you and I would really be honest, we would admit that the church is full of broken people with broken lives, broken friendships as a result of broken promises. There are broken marriages resulting in broken families. And many churches have broken children who play with their little broken friends who live in a broken community. And yet, here is the mission you and I have been called to by Jesus. He sends this broken army called the church with broken people out into a broken world to put the pieces back together. Wow, what a challenge. What that means is while we are being repaired and put back together by Jesus, we have been commanded by Jesus to go out in our brokenness and repair what is wrong with the world. Maybe that's why it's taken so long. <laughs> Maybe we are so overwhelmed by all the problems of the world that we have forgotten that we have a problem solver on our side who specializes in heart fixing and mind regulating, lifting up bowed down heads and making life worth living. What am I trying to tell us is that as long as the church has been in the world doing what God has called us to do in this part of his moral vineyard, we've been working on a broken building, and I'm not talking about the plumbing, not talking about the electrical system or the sound system that was just explained to you. I've pastored churches that get caught up in building programs and have forgotten which building they're supposed to be working on first. I've discovered that God will take care of the bricks and mortar, the pews and the stained glass windows if we take care of the stones who come to the building and sit in the pew. God wants us to be concerned about the broken stones sitting right next to us in church. The broken stones standing at the door and even the marred clay who's preaching in the pulpit. All of us are works in progress. Jesus is working on all of us and he's not through with us yet. The task seems almost impossible and it would be easy to stop doing the work of the, of the church 
beyond these four walls and be satisfied with only doing church work within these walls, except for one thing. Scripture says there's another stone, a perfect stone, the one that the builders rejected. Even Peter, who wrote this epistle, was possibly the most marred and defective disciple Jesus chose, next to possibly Judas. But look at him now, writing about being put back together, being worked on by God. It's true that we once were dead stones and now living stones. It's true that we are marred and broken and have been called to go out into a broken world to repair it in the name of Jesus. But never forget, we have a cornerstone. We have a stone the builders rejected. His name is Jesus. We have a stone that cannot be moved. We have a stone that is perfect in all its ways. And when we go out, we do not go out alone. He has promised to go with us, be with us, protect us, empower us, even to the end of the world. Be encouraged, beloved. I know it looks bad, sounds bad, but whenever we meet, he's working on a building. When it seems that the harder we try, the worse things seem to get, don't worry, Jesus is working on a building. It's his job, his responsibility. It's his church, not ours. He announced it at Caesarea Philippi, but he drew up the blueprint out there on Calvary. He hung, bled, and died that he might make us and remake us into something usable <coughs> for his service. He solidified his church with his resurrection when he got up with all power in his hands. That's why I'm not worried when I make mistakes. I realize he's still working on me. I don't get upset when I fall. I know he will pick me up because he's still working on Ellis. But one day when my work down here is done, Jesus is coming after me because he told me that I have another building when he said, in my father's house are many mansions, and I'm going away to prepare one for you. And then in 1 Corinthians 5 and 1, Paul says, if this earthly house be dissolved, we have a building not made by hands. That means we have another house, one not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, one that won't grow old, one that does not leak, break down, and fall down, an eternal building of God. Beloved, come with me to hymn number 102. As we sing verses 1, 2, and 4, Jesus, the very thought of thee. Verses 1, 2, and 4, remain seated.
One more quick announcement. Out in the narthex is a table with last year's directory on it. We're trying to update our directory, so on your way out, if you'd take a quick peek, see if your name, address, and phone numbers are correct, and then write OK by your name. If not, write in the correct information. We now come to the part of our service, uh, which is sacred, that is, the moment of communion. As we participate together, let us remember that this is not just a table for food and drink, but it's a table of grace, unity. Here we are all welcome, no matter where we are in our spiritual journey. If you uh, are just starting out, we invite you to take and participate in this holy meal. This is the place where we put our differences aside and celebrate the gift of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us all. Let this communion be a reminder of the inclusivity and the acceptance that Jesus taught us. After the deacons bring you the elements, hold on to them until Ellis uh, directs us and when we can participate together. After you're done, if you'll leave your cup in the back of the pews. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this meal that brings us together. Bless these elements and each person here today. May we feel your presence and love in this moment and may it strengthen us to go out and share your love with the world. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, in the upper room with his disciples, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to them and said, this is my body, and they ate together.
in the same manner, took the cup. He blessed it. He explained to them that this is the new covenant now in his blood. And they took it and they drank it together. And he said, as often as you eat this bread and you drink from this cup, do, you do show forth my suffering until I come. As we prepare to receive our offerings, let us remember that our gifts are a reflection of our gratitude for God's abundant blessings. In the spirit of generosity, we invite you to give joyfully, knowing that every contribution supports the mission and the ministry of our church. Together, let us invest in the work bringing hope, love, and service to our community and beyond. Gracious and loving God, we come before you with thankful hearts for the many blessings you have bestowed upon us. We ask that you bless these gifts and the hands that have given them. May they be used to further your work in the world, to bring hope to the hopeless, and to share your love with all. As we give, help us to remember our call to serve and to live in unity as the body of Christ. In your name we pray, amen. Christ is still calling stones. He's taking dead stones. He's making them living stones. If you're one of those who have not been touched by the grace of God, you can come forth during the invitational hymn found on 589, Lord, I want to be a Christian. Or if you would come and have a desire to unite with this congregation, you may do so during this hymn. Lord, I want to be a Christian. <clears throat>
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let the church say, Amen. Amen.